Wow, Mission Sunday, you guys, so exciting. I hope that you're stirred for some of these trips. We did uh, get, I think, pretty close to sending about 10% of our people last year, which is our goal. I'd love to see it go to 20%. So please sign up, uh, lean into this, you guys. Um, I believe the Lord wants to use so many people in this room to go touch the nations. Aren't you glad we're in a missional house? A house that believes in sending, uh, sending people out. My wife actually had a, by the way, it's on January 28th, it's my wife and I's one year anniversary. Can you believe it? I feel like I've gotten so comfortable. I feel like I was, I've always been married, but it's really been a year, which is amazing. Amazing restoration story there of God just redeeming the, the years and cannot be happier just being married. My wife is not feeling the best, so she was gonna be leading worship. She was gonna be singing in Hebrew this morning, but she's home resting. So hello, honey, I know you're at home. Uh, Say hi to Joel, he's our online pastor. Um, And uh, so yeah, our one year anniversary, it's been amazing. Uh, Life on the ranch, I'm sure you're all wondering, it's going well. Uh, I think last time I preached, I talked about having to climb down in a septic system to fix our water system. Um, My father-in-law teaches me the ropes on the ranch. Morgan, you wanna give a wave? He's our our facilities manager. so it's gotten cold down there, and Monument, it's about 10 to 15 degrees colder than it is here. It's like 8,000 feet, which I did not realize before I moved down there. <laughs> but it's getting colder, and uh, we live uh, in a cabin built in the 1800s that doesn't have central heating, so that means that we need to chop wood if we're going to stay warm. And uh, Morgan has taken me out back to the wood pile and taught me how to split wood. Has anybody split wood in here before? Wow. I was new to it. Apparently, I'm a city boy. Uh, <laughs> But there's a technique to this thing. You kind of, we get these big logs, you know, and we put them on top of the kind of the splitting stump, and then you look carefully at the top of this stump at where the cracks are. There's usually the heart of the tree is in the middle, and you're looking for these cracks. And then uh, we, we, I like to do it together with somebody, but you put a wedge or an ax right in the crack, and then I get the mole and just swing that mole and hit the ax right into that crack. And if you just hit it just right, all of a sudden, the log busts open, you know, and then you just feel amazing. That's where like your (laughs) testosterone jumps up a few amps. You're like, yeah, oh, you know, you're splitting that wood. Pieces are flying. It's awesome. And then you get to carry it in and my wife is drinking tea and reading her book. She says, thank you, honey. She throws it in the fire. (laughs) And so my my job is to keep her comfortable inside the cabin. (laughs) Yeah. Life on the ranch. What a blessing. Wow. It's really a privilege. Uh, (laughs) The Brown Ranch, they've owned the land. Their family's owned the land for a long time since they've been down in Monument for like 150 years, one of the older families in Monument. So it's a privilege to marry into that family. There's streets named after Morgan's grandpa and stuff, you know, around town down there. So what a blessing to be down there. Um, You know, thinking about Mission Sunday, though, when you're splitting wood like that, um, one of the things I realized, I'm like, there's got to be a sermon in this somewhere, you know? (laughs) Here's the good news, is no matter how much the world wants to celebrate godlessness and not recognize Jesus in the world and try to make it look like they have it all figured out, there are weaknesses in the systems of the world because they are not built on the foundation of Christ. And it's just a matter of time before their systems dry out like an old log and cracks form and weaknesses are there. And then if you just bring the love of Jesus and bring the kingdom All you have to do is just get focused and recognize the need and swing the kingdom and boom, all of a sudden an old law goes into this usable firewood and they can be lit on fire in a second. You're looking for the weaknesses in the world to bring the solutions of the kingdom. So there you go. (laughs) And the great news is I like to think I'm swinging really hard, but actually the mall is doing a lot of the work. If you actually just get that thing aimed right and just let it swing and you let it do the work, it's kind of like golfing, you know, if you swing really hard, you miss, but if you just let that club do the work, it just just glides, there's no feeling like it. Same thing with chopping wood, if you just let the mall do the heavy lifting. It's like if you just show up and you're in the right time, right place, and you notice where there's hurt and there's pain and dissatisfaction, which will happen when you're not walking with Jesus, All you gotta do is release the love of God, and boom, all of a sudden, in moments, what looks like an unbreakable stump can blow to pieces and they can be available to receive God's love, amen? Um, So that's good news. Um, 
I'm gonna talk to you today about climbing the mountain of God. And uh, I asked Margie to bring back her painting because she painted this a few weeks ago while I was preparing this sermon. I was like, this is exactly what I wanna be preaching on, so I'm gonna use this illustration. Margie, thank you for painting that. Also, I really appreciate this painting over here. Was it Lori that was painting this morning? Thank you for painting it. This is a painting about rest and letting God take you down the river of life and, and remaining in rest and peace. You can see the light of God dawning over the horizon, which will also tie into the sermon today. So when Jesus released the Great Commission, and I know this is probably the most standard verse, I'm not gonna camp out here, but when it comes to missions, I noticed some different things today as I was reading back to Matthew 28. I'll read it now, uh, verse 16. Now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. So they actually go, they're going up a mountain and this is actually Mount Arbel. It's 1,250 feet above the Sea of Galilee. I have a photo of this mountain, I think that Doug has. And uh, this mountain actually overlooks a lot of the places where Jesus had ministered, where the, the, the sea had quieted, where uh, G- Jesus had fed the multitudes. It was this overlook, this high place that he brought the, the disciples up to. And when they saw him, they worshiped him. Just a side note. Uh, for the cults out there that don't believe that Jesus is God. <clears throat> I won't name names, but G- you don't worship an angel. You don't worship a prophet. They worship Jesus because he is God. Amen? Amen. All right. I uh, just felt good to say that. Uh, but some doubted. <clears throat> and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you to the end of the ages. What's interesting is when Jesus was in the desert, Satan actually took Jesus to a high mountaintop and said, if you just worship me, I'll give you the nations of the earth. But Jesus resisted that temptation, overcame sin and death on the cross, then took the disciples to a high mountaintop and said, now I'm sending you to go take the nations. I bet it felt a little daunting to be the disciples. <laughs> You're going on a hike, that was probably hard enough. You know, maybe they're gasping for air. Uh, they didn't probably have camelbacks in that day. They probably had little goat skins and they're drinking water going up to this mountain. And if that wasn't hard enough, now Jesus says, I'm giving you authority to go take all the nations. No pressure, you know. How did the disciples feel? You know, here they are, Jesus really focused on the, the, the Israeli nation. And of course, he, we know with the woman at the well that he reached some... Uh, some, you know, some Samaritans and some other nations, but primarily to the, the Israelites, and then he just hands the rest of the world to the disciples. And to me, that would be intimidating. It's like, wow, okay, thanks, Jesus. Good modeling. Now it's our turn. We're, we're taking the world. Um, that's intimidating. Um, but the thing is, is I think there's something about them being on a mountaintop that's significant. And I believe that your position in Christ is actually what helps prepare you and qualify you to go take the nations. I think sometimes we get intimidated by the assignment in front of us, and we actually forget the power and the modeling that Jesus had set forth with the kingdom of heaven that now dwells within us. So here they are on top of a mountain, and I I gotta believe as they're kind of grasping at straws and energy of like, how are we gonna do this? I believe that they came to the point where they said, listen, we're on a mountain, we're with Jesus, we've been given the kingdom, and Jesus has given us the authority. And I think that positioning on top of that mountain with Jesus was significant in them launching to actually bring the gospel to the nations. Mountaintops scripturally have been related to connectivity and intimacy with God. We see the Mount of Transfiguration where they go up on top of the mountain and then Jesus actually manifests a glorious um, depiction of a human filled with the glory of God. It says that his garments became like lightning. And we have Moses going up Mount Sinai and, and encountering the lightnings of God. There's something about intimacy with God that actually uh, pre- prepares us to go take the word to the nations. Um, so I'm gonna talk about what it looks like to be seated on the mountain of God, okay? Seated on the mountain of God. You guys see these doors right here? That's what we're after this morning. And so Isaiah 62, I'm gonna read 
verses one and then verse 10. For Zion's sake, I will not hold my peace. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not rest until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a lamp that burns or like a burning torch, another translation says. So there's something about being positioned in righteousness that makes us like a burning torch going forth to the nations. And then verse 10, I'll jump down there. It says, go through the gates, prepare the way for the people. Who? I think the people that need to come into Zion, that need to come into salvation, that need to find God. Prepare the way for the people. Build up, build up the highway. Take out the stones and lift up a banner for the people. There's something about the path of righteousness that becomes a torch, a beacon of light to the world. Removing stumbling blocks from your own path holds up a banner for the lost, for them to follow you into salvation. And the Lord gave me this picture a while back of like, our lives should be like a gateway or a window where when people look at our lives, they don't see us, but they see within us a pathway to Zion, a pathway to encountering freedom, a pathway to encountering joy and life, a pathway to going to Zion, a place of encounter with God. Our lives should be a window to encounters with God. And when we remove the stumbling blocks out of our own lives to clear the path so we can run freely to God, it's like our lives become a smooth path for others to come right behind us. I actually feel prophetically like this is significant for the house. When I was praying about Peter's journey, his apostolic call in the region and in the world, I saw this picture in one of our staff soaking of Peter climbing up like one of those tall mountains. Can't you just see it? I went backpacking with him last summer, so I know how he is. He gets on the trail. He's resilient. He's incredibly in great shape, you know, for his age. He does really well on the trail. But I saw in this picture, he had like the best gear on. Anybody like Patagonia or uh, North Face or, um, I'm actually saying these things so I can get sponsored by them. So I, you know, <laughs> I'm hoping they're going to send me a new jacket in the mail. No, I'm just kidding. I just, I just, uh, I just love when you have the right gear. Somebody said there's no bad weather. You just, there's only wrong gear. It's only bad gear. If you have the right gear, it's like you can get through anything. But Peter had the right gear on. He was climbing to the top and I saw him put his, his ice pick in the top of a mountain, stand up. And I was like, the Lord was like, Peter is going to uh, land on his objectives. He's going to reach the call of his life. And we're gonna help him get there. And then I turned around in the picture and the vision and I saw a whole bunch of people coming up the mountain behind him. And he was making a way for everybody to stand on high places and gain the mountaintops of where the church belongs to be and, and having the authority to release the kingdom. And so there's something in our positioning that enables us to live out the calling. And sometimes we get consumed with the mountain of what seems impossible to reach the nations rather than being consumed with the authority within us that God has breathed and built through our process of walking with him and walking the path and walking the journey. Amen? So I'm gonna, I love scripture, so I'm a little nerdy with this. I'm gonna jump through a lot of scripture partially just to kind of fortify what I'm gonna be sharing about this morning. David wrote in Psalms, a Psalms of Repentance. This is right after he fell with Bathsheba. Um, terrible time for David. Nathan came and confronted him about it. And he started in Psalms 51, he started talking about, Lord, cleanse me, wash every unclean thing out of me. In other words, return me to righteousness. Put my feet back in the seat of righteousness where he belongs. And he says in Psalms 51, 12 through 13, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me joy and salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. There's something about when we are established on the mountain of God that all of a sudden starts to bring sinners to repentance and starts to bring them back to God. The disciples were commissioned to reach the world, but what maybe they didn't realize right in the moment when they were handed the nations is they'd actually been walking with Jesus and been discipled by him. And the things that they observed by walking with God had prepared them for the assignment that was handed to them on the top of Mount Arbel. So Romans chapter 14, verse 17, I'm gonna to come to the mountain of God. I was actually at a... Uh, New Year's uh, party years ago where a bunch of us had gone to One Thing Conference 
but some of us had stayed back, so we just streamed the event, streamed the worship. We were praying for one another, prophesying over one another, and by the end of the night, the spirit fell so heavily at about one or two in the morning. By the way, this is the right way to spend a New Year's, encountering Jesus, come on. <laughs> it's the best. We all ended up in separate parts of the apartment, kind of just having these vision encounters where we all felt raptured up in his glory. We felt light. We lost track of time. I don't know how long we were standing there, but I was standing on my own encountering God, and the Lord showed me a picture of a mountain, and he brought to mind Romans 14, 17, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And I feel like the Lord said, John, this, this order of things, righteousness, peace, and joy is not an accident. It's actually the ascension up the mount of God. Righteousness is like base camp, okay? You have to go through it before you start going up the mount of God. Peace is the ascension up the stairway where the Holy Spirit's leading you away from the noise, the noise of culture, the noise of distraction. Anybody else fasting distraction? Hasn't it been helpful? I feel collectively so much more able to focus on God and actually focus on people. Like, rather than thinking of cats and mountain bikes and I don't know what else shows up, traveling and pictures of the nation. It's all great stuff on social media. It's, it's inspiring. But without all that clutter in my life, I'm able to actually be more intentional about the people in my life, praying for people, thinking about people, thinking about how I want to do family with people in this next year. When you go through base camp of righteousness and you start to ascend the mountain of God, it gets peaceful. It gets quiet. And the fellowship with the Holy Spirit starts to glue you together because he's your Sherpa, you know, to use Mount Everest climbing terms. He's guiding you up the mountain of God. And then at the top of the mountain, there's joy. And after God spoke this to me, I love, don't you love those revelations you get? And you're like, I wonder where this is in the Bible. And over the next year, God just shows you all the verses where it's at. I found this pattern through scripture everywhere. It's actually amazing. Um, Let's look at a few of them. Matthew 6, verses 33. But seek ye first, everybody say first, first. the kingdom of God and his righteousness, base camp. And all of these things will be added to you. The journey of God, the beautiful ascent into his kingdom will be added to you after you seek first his righteousness. There's an order to the way we pursue God. Hebrews 12 verses 14 says, pursue holiness without which no one will see God. God's home, his temple, his tabernacle, filled with joy at the top of the mountain. We'll see those patterns later on in scripture. Without holiness and righteousness, you're never gonna get to the top of the mountain to encounter God. Holiness and righteousness is not a restrictive jail cell that you have to sit in to be religious enough for God to come and have tea with you or have a conversation. Holiness is a pathway through which we journey through a refining process so we can actually live an elevated spiritual life above the snake line where there can be a lot of chaos around us, a lot of temptation, a lot of godlessness, but we are still living in a place of complete awe and encounter with Jesus in the midst of it all. And I can tell you right now, the world is not looking for a reflection of the world right now. The world is looking for a reflection of Jesus, a clean clear, pure reflection of Jesus. That's why I believe David was, was praying. He said, God, cleanse me from every ounce of unrighteousness so that the lost would return to you and know you. Isaiah 32, verse 17, and the effect or the result of righteousness, the effect or the result of righteousness will be peace. If you choose righteousness in your life, all of a sudden peace is gonna to start to break out. Things are gonna settle down because when sin is in your life, it brings the chaos, it brings waves, it brings you know, confusion. Talk about, if you wanna be confused about your calling or why are you even come to church or what you're even called to do or if you're w wasting your time with Jesus, try sinning. Does it every time. You will be so confused for two or three days. You'll be like, wait, wait a second, is Bridgeway, are they all just crazy? What am I doing? But then you get past the sin, you get right with God again. It's like, oh no, there's a sweet spot. I'm encountering Jesus. I go where the presence is. I go where revival is. My life does make sense. 
So when we get rid of sin in our lives, all the waves quiet down. And trust me, the little ones matter. The little sins matter. Sometimes if you've got a bad habit, you're like, oh, what's one more day? What's one more sin? But when you realize that the world and the nations of the earth and people who need an encounter with God, they are relying on your walk with God, the fact of you carrying the anointing, you being pure and clean and bright, they're relying on you to bring the gospel message right to their front door. So do not forsake your calling to bring the good news to the nations by bowing the knee to sin. It's like trading your authority on the, trading, the spiritual trading floor. When you sin, you're trading the authority God's given you for that sin. And I'm not saying you should wallow in shame, guilt, or condemnation. I'm just saying don't sin. And when you do, just get right back on that path again. Get rid of it all. You know, imagine yourself, rather than being kicked out like the prodigal son, if you just make one step in the wrong direction, just run into the inner courts of your father and let him hold you and pull the arrowy darts, you know, out of you from that sin. Let him love you back to righteousness. Amen? Righteousness. Psalms 37, 37. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace. You see in the pattern? It's wild. Psalms 24, verses three through four. Who may ascend until the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully. Are you guys getting how important righteousness is? I'll tell you, I, uh, there was a time in my life after I went through my first divorce, it was unfortunate. Um, you know, there's always two sides of it, but my wife did decide to leave the faith and she's a good person. And uh, after years of prayer, by the way, she came back and became a Catholic and actually came to the second Worship on the Rocks because she liked the artist and she became a Christian again. So there's a happy ending to that. Yeah. Yeah, because my, my, my two daughters and I prayed for her for years that she would come back out of universalism, and she did. God restored her. Um, so bless her. Um, but in that season, I went through a really hard time, and I, all my Christian friends were married, and I just went back to my old life, and all my old friends were like bartenders and DJs and all this stuff from my college days. Totally not where I should ever be. Um, this was about, what, 15 years ago. Um, but what I realized is that I had like gone out, and I thought I was standing on some kind of a mountain. Because I was like standing, I, I felt seen, I had some community but now that I'm standing with God on the mountain of God, I look back and realize I was just standing on a mountain of trash. That was a mountain of destruction. That was a worldly mountain with no value. But at the time, I was proud of it. I was like, oh, my friends are cool. I'm going to cool places. I'm like, but man, once you taste of the heights and the spirit of standing on the mountain of God, where like you can see the big picture, you can feel God's presence, your spirit is connected uh, with the Holy Spirit and he's leading you into all truth, your whole world comes to life in vivid color. And you look back and you say, oh my gosh, what I was proud of in my sin years, I was just standing on a heap of garbage. It was nothing. And I, if, if only I'd realized that sooner. But you know what? God's sovereign. And he redeems all things. And uh, 10 years of prison ministry and being able to use my testimonies to see inmates saved and crying and weeping. And it was like God restored it. God had justice in that. He's amazing. Um, so peace to joy. So we've, let, we've gone through righteousness and we're headed up the path of peace and we're heading towards joy. Let's look at scripture around that. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 20. Deceit is in the heart of those who devise evil, but those who plan peace have joy. Those who plan for peace and walk with God in peace have joy. Joy represents the altitude with God, a place of encounter his holy dwelling place of encounter. That's where we should live, right? David said, this one thing I seek is to dwell in his holy place, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. All true beauty in life comes from holiness. All true, anything good that you want in life, it comes going through the pathway of holiness. Hebrews 1.9 says, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. So when you love righteousness and hate wickedness, God will actually release the oil of joy in your life. Psalms 48, verses one through two. I know this is a lot of scripture. I just love scripture. It's, uh, unapologetically, I'm not sorry. 
Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth. I just, man, I've been carrying this revelation for like 15 years and I'm like, this is the Lord. You know, because the thing is, once you recognize this pattern, you can examine where you're at in life. Like, are, are you struggling to find peace in life? Well, is righteousness in order in your house? Get righteousness in order in your house and be surrounded with loving community. I know that, that sometimes things come from the externals and they disrupt, they bring chaos, they bring fear, and it's not our fault, per se. But if you get the foundations of righteousness in place, it sets the stage for peace. And once the shalom peace of God comes, then it actually, like Peter said a few weeks ago, that peace is fertile ground for joy. When you get peace in your life, then all of a sudden joy starts to build. And I believe that the mark of joy on somebody's life is a mark of maturity with their walk with God. I'm not talking about naive joy. I'm talking about mature, deep-founded, bubbling up springs of joy. All my favorite heroes of the faith, people that have changed nations, David Hogan, Heidi Baker, you know, these wild people that love Jesus, they're all marked with extreme joy. I usually don't listen to any of their sermons without laughing out loud, you know, like Bobby Connors' stories of, you know, being raised in the South. He's hilarious. There's so much joy to be had in the kingdom. And I'm, like, like we shared at the pastor's gathering at 400 Gathering, God wants to restore the joy of the Lord on the bride of Christ. If you had a friend that was engaged to be married and they looked depressed and weary and tired and they're like, yeah, the wedding's coming up. And it's going okay. You'd be like, man, who are they marrying? Like, <laughs> they should be joyful, right? Like, if we're the bride of Christ that are supposed to be the torch to the nations, the light of God on the earth, it has to be a joy. It has to be flashes of light coming out of your eyes, an illuminating smile, the heart of God coming through your eyes for people. They gotta feel it. And trust me, even if they don't turn right in that moment, they will walk away thinking about why did that person look so crazy happy? Like, what's going on in their lives, you know? They will be marked with it. Psalms 43, the verses three through four, send out your light and your truth let them lead me, let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the lyre, O oh God, my God. So if you wanna be a light, you need to live on the mountain of, of God, a place where your thinking is elevated above the world's systems, a place where you can see the big picture living from another country, the country of heaven, a place of authority, a place of fullness. That's where we need to minister from. And if we're filled with that position, taking on the nations actually becomes a delight instead of an intimidating task because we're just taking the love of God wherever we go. So righteousness, peace, and joy, they're not only elements to the path to the high places in God, they're actually also seats of authority. Righteousness is a seat of authority. Peace is a seat of authority and joy is a seat of authority. And that is the kingdom of heaven. So being seated in heavenly realms is making sure that you stay in those three seats. I'm telling you, the enemy will always try to get you out of one of those three seats. He will attack your righteousness to try to bring chaos. He'll, if you're righteous and you're walking well with the Lord, he'll try to bring chaos into your life to get you out of the seat of peace. Or he'll try to bring frustration, weariness to get rid of your joy. Do not accept it because you have a rightful position to stay seated in all three of those seats. It is the Christian normal life to walk in holiness, complete peace, and complete joy. And they are seats of authority. Jesus, we, come, we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb? Righteousness. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but my peace I give to you because I've over, already overcome the world. So he sent the disciples out with his peace to go overcome the world. And then Jesus in Hebrews 12, hanging on the cross said, as he was suffering, he was overcoming it with the joy set before him, which is that you and I would actually be able to actually walk with peace and joy through all trials and tribulations on the earth as well. 
Is this good? What? It's good news. We get to be joyful. Come on. <laughs> so Isaiah 52, verse 7, how beautiful on the mountaintops are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. It means we're going out into the world declaring, I'm releasing peace into your life. I'm declaring God reigns in your life. From the high place that God's put me on, I'm going to reach into the valleys and raise you out of places of despair to come be seated with me in heavenly realms. Come on, let's go be seated with Christ. A few things about climbing Everest. I'm almost done here. We're not doing too bad, 1142. Okay, um, a few facts about climbing Everest is that you need to be healed before you get to the top of Everest because your blood actually gets so thin that if you have scrapes or bruises or scratches, you'll bleed out because your, butt, your blood gets so thin. So part of the process of staying put on the mountain of God and living in the high places in the spirit, you gotta get healed up because those little triggers and wounds will make you stumble and falter and make you feel weak and unable to make the journey. Thus, that was a big plug for Rebecca Schwab and Steve Reeser and the whole <laughs> awakened heart folks. You can never be too healed up. Get your heart healed so you can abide on the mountaintops. It's huge, it's a big deal. I will go through however much heart healing is available that would be helpful for me because I believe in it wholeheartedly. It enables, it like heals your heart so you can actually contain the love of God and rather than leaking out the bottom of your wounds, it'll actually overflow as a spring of life to people around you. It's a big deal. The other thing is the top of Everest, it's called the dead zone. When you go up there, there's so little oxygen that if you were to stay up there, your body would slowly start to die. But it's interesting. I believe living on the mountain of God, we have to stay dead to ourselves. Sometimes we can believe we're on the mountain of God, but if it actually, through tradition and religion, we can become so comfortable in our awareness of revelation and stewarding all that God's given us and all the conferences we've gone to, that it can quickly turn to preservation and pride. Before you know it, you might be standing on a different mountain, just preserving a mountain that was actually not God's best for you. But I believe there's a new thing in this year that God wants to release, and that's brokenness. Brokenness, allowing God to break you and to take all the things that you've learned and break it out at the feet of the lost like an alabaster jar. All the revelation, all the years you've spent walking with God, rather than preserving it on a monument over here in your own walk, you're taking it and you're breaking at the feet of the lost. That act of brokenness, I believe, keeps you connected to the humility and being dead to yourself to keep you on the mountain of God. This has been missing in a lot of our worship. We're really good at polish. We're really good at great outfits. We're really good at joy and amazing lights and good sound, but it's been a while since I've heard somebody weep from the stage because of their brokenness before the Lord. I actually just heard it again for the first time in years when Kevin Prosh resurfaced in a video from a little church in Texas where he was weeping on the stage, and I started weeping with him, and I looked at my wife, Karen, and I was like, this is what worship needs. This is what the church needs. We need to be willing to take all the incredible value and riches that God's put in us and just like break it out at the feet of the cross again. Break it out at the feet of people who need God. So when people come walking into this church, they find broken, contrite, humble people that have more than enough to give to them, more than enough to pour into their lives. And I actually believe there's an acceleration coming when our fathers in the house reconnect with the hearts of the sons all the years you've spent walking with God, climbing this mountain, learning the ways of how to navigate through life, the Pilgrim's Progress years, if you will take the time and reinvest that into our young men and our young women of this house, there will be a divine acceleration to actually reap the harvest. So don't miss out on that. Don't get too comfortable. Hunt people down that need love and pour it out. Pour out your very best at their feet. Man, that felt good to say. Um, for marketplace people, there is a path of favor and divine insight that God has placed on your life. And you walking this path and taking it into the marketplace, bringing the wisdom of God, will actually be a powerful witness to other business people around you. Proverbs 15, verses 19, I'm on the home stretch. 
The way of the sluggard is overgrown with thorns. It pricks, lacerates, and entangles him. But the way of the righteous is plain and raised up like a highway. What does it look like to remove the stumbling blocks off the highway to encounters with God? What does it look like when other business owners look at your business and they're like, why are you prospering? Where did you get this idea to do that? Why are you doing this amazing thing? And you can say, well, it's the favor of God. It's the direction of the Holy Spirit. How many have felt that when God literally divinely removes roadblocks right out of your path and he like bends creation into your favor and you're like, I met people I should have never met. Appointments were set up I never even intended to have. It all worked in my favor. It all worked in my advantage. There is a place of witness when it comes to the divine favor of walking the path of standing on the mountain of God. And it will be a powerful witness in these days. Isaiah 26, verses seven, the path of the righteous is level. You make level the way, you make it smooth the way of the righteous. God will actually help smooth out your path when you commit to this journey, climbing the mountain of God. I'm not proposing religion, self-effort. I'm proposing knowing your position in God and journeying to get completely free from the things that entangle you from dwelling where you belong, which is in face-to-face encounters with the Holy Spirit in a place of joy. Amen. Amen. So be ready. Be standing in that place of encounter. Be seated in the seats of authority of righteousness, peace, or joy so that you are ready that when you go out to the world and you see somebody with cracks and bruises and their systems are failing them, that boom, you bring the kingdom of heaven in and all of a sudden the tears fly and things break open. And like Watchman Nee talks about in the book, Release of the Spirit, the outer flesh that's kept them captive can bust open in a minute and their spirit can come back to life. The gasp of life, they come back to life because they realize God is true. And this person that came into my life, bringing me that word, bringing me that miracle, bringing me that prayer, tracking me down on the streets, giving up their Saturdays to go hunt down the one that's held captive to their failing systems. Boom, the kingdom comes in and shatters the shell off of them, and they come back to life. And in moments, they become usable by the kingdom. The next thing you know, they're on fire. Wow. Um, I think that's all I got. But let's invite Daniel up. He's gonna close us out for ministry time. Um, Let me just uh, pray over everyone in this room. Lord, we just thank you for this amazing season ahead of us. I believe this is a banner year for us. And It may be in the mission field as people go out. It may be on the streets as our evangelism teams go, Lord. It may be amazing business exploits that God just breaks something open for for you, an amazing opportunity where you can thrive and bring the light of God to just have divine structure to put things together that don't make sense in the world systems, but God does something incredible with them, Lord. I pray that every person in this room would be like a torch going out into into the darkness, that as we position ourselves on the mountain of God where we have always belonged, that we would become an amazing light that would be undeniable to anybody that encounters us and that many, many would be saved and join our midst within this next year. Jesus' name, amen.